give a huge welcome to Sharon Jones and the Dap King. Hit it. Woo! Sharon's voice is like a train. You better get out the way. People have called Sharon Jones a female James Brown. In the 1980s, Sharon Jones was working in a series of jobs that included a corrections officer. Correction officer at Rikers. She doesn't have a radio hit, but she has a huge audience all over the world. Please welcome back Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. years we've been constantly going i remember the first winter there was no heat sharon and i did all the electricity it was tough they said i was too fat too black too short and too old and look at me now all this hard work is finally paying off something was clearly wrong her eyes were yellow she was losing weight and the doctor said it's cancer she might not come back we were freaked out, you know? This is my sister. She can be real tough. This isn't the end of her career. This is the middle. Go on, Sharon. You know this is what you do. Get on out there and sing. But I told myself, God bless you with a gift. Use your gift. I have no eyebrows, but I'll be looking cute. I feel my day is coming. We're going to sell a million records. Please welcome Miss Sharon Jones. The show must go on. That's the best seat right there. And she can have my seat, actually, if she wants. She can host. Oh, fine. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay. All right. Sharon Jones, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, guys. I was Barbara Koppel, thank you so much for being well, here. Well, thanks for having us. Yes. Congratulations on a wonderful portrait of one of our best performers that we have. Thank you so much for making this documentary, Barbara. I was honored and blessed to do it, and I learned so much from Sharon Jones by doing it, about being real, about being positive, authentic, and this is a friendship that will never end. How did it start? How did you, how did you come to Sharon Jones? Did you know of her music before you started the documentary? I only knew <laughs> 100 days, 100 nights. <laughs> But now I know everything, and as I sit and I listen to the film, I sing along, and people are wondering who's that woman singing everything in <laughs> front of us. But uh, Alex, who is her manager, was really impassioned, and he really wanted to do this film, so he went to VH1. Two of my friends were working there, Steve Mintz and Brad Abramson, and I had done a film with them called Woodstock Now and Then, about the 40th anniversary of Woodstock. And they called me and they said, how would you like to do a film about Sharon Jones? And I went, whoa, really? And that's how it started. And I started filming a week later. At this point, uh, Sharon, by the time you started filming, Sharon, had you been diagnosed at that point? Or oh, was the... Yes, I had. You had. been diagnosed. I had already had the operation. What the film didn't show was I had the Whipple. Um, I, I was like, I'm June... Whatever I went in, I was in the hospital. Yeah, thir I was in it 13 days, and so the Whipple they removed like my gallbladder, the head of my pancreas, and a foot and a half of my small intestines. So when Barbara and them saw me, I had this. Did I have the bag? I had clothes. Yeah, you look like a football it. player on your yeah, stomach. Yeah, I was bent over. <laughs> yeah, like a zipper. So I yeah. mean, you wanted to pick it up and. <laughs> yeah, at, at oh, the, the photo with the timing, staples. Was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could barely walk. You know, everything was all bent over. You know, so. Yeah. yeah, and also, too, my very first day of meeting Sharon was when she had her hair cut and she had her head shaved. The, that whole transformation that happened. Time. And then the wonderful part after that is I got to go with her when she was trying on her wigs, and she was hysterical. Great scene. 
And I just knew this is going to be somebody that's going to be so amazing to film. Yeah. So, so you're so rich and full of life in every moment that you live in the film. The, the low moments are, are so expressive and you're so real, as Barbara said. And then even within those low moments, you find great, piece, great moments of comedy you to express yourself through. You have to. I, I think that's, you know, humor. It gets you through a lot of stuff, you know, just like music to me. You know, it, it soothes, it heals, and a little humor every once in a while. You know, keep you know it's better to smile than you know. Look Jen, I, I have to ask. You know, as we saw in the trailer and as we see at the beginning of the film, you know, for before you were sort of a, a well-known performer, and even just a known performer, you had this completely different kind of anonymous life. And even as a performer, you've been known, but you're not as big as I think you should be, and I think as fans of, of, of you think you should be. What's it like to have someone like Barbara Koppel and, and, and want to come and, and tell your story? You know, I, I didn't think I had a story. Be nice. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't think I had a story. But um, once Barbara and the, and the film crew assured me, I mean, Look at that. How can I tell her no? You know? <laughs> it's like once you look at that face, it's like anything you want, you know. And they're like, you know, Barbara gonna get away. I like, just certain things I just do not want. And they she they granted me that. It's, you think about it. I didn't want a reality show. I did not want y'all to be watching this film and all of a sudden I'm getting out of bed. Like what the camera crew slept with me, you know? And so Well that could be fun. Oh, it would not be fun. So Barbara, that's one thing she respects, so I'm grateful that I, and once they said, once I accepted it, said, okay, I'm going to do this, then that whole thing changed. It wasn't about me. It was about my family, the band, people going to get to see what we struggled, what we went through, and as long as I can inspire someone out there to be strong, you know, don't give up, to be a fighter, and so that's where I took it then. It was all about getting out my fans, people seeing my story. Were there ever moments that you didn't want to be filmed that you had to express to Barbara that maybe now is not the time? Because there's a great moment in the, in the middle of the film that I was so happy to see, because even though we want to tell a positive story about somebody, we want to show somebody in a positive light that's going through a battle, there's a great moment where you're very emotional with your bandmates about a dinner that you wanted yeah. to have. And that is so clearly, as a, from real. a viewer, that's you going through something on your own that you're kind of taking out on them, but at the same time you have every right to right. be doing that. It's a, it's a really honest moment in the and film. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I never saw any of the movie before I refused to go and see little nis snippets. You and weren't I, even asked. Yeah, you know, and I was like, <laughs> right. And it was like, I don't want to. And, the, and when they said, you want to come and see some parts of it, I was like, no. You know, I don't want to see. And I said, glad. I didn't go see the movie because I would have asked her to cut that scene out. I didn't like the part of me cursing. and I mean, even though that's me, that's who I am. But I didn't like that. I did not want that on tape. But first thing Barbara said, well, but it's you. And it's the truth. And I said, yeah, I was angry. I was mad. And I really felt hurt. So I'm glad I she kept that in there. So now it's OK. I just tell my church people, don't you judge me. <laughs> <laughs> No, but Sharon really never stopped us. And also, too, we weren't prevalent. Um, what was prevalent is Sharon and her band and getting well and singing. And we were the least important thing that Sharon had to worry about. So we sort of just faded into the background, but didn't miss anything. And Absolutely. sometimes I would mess with them, though. You know, there was one scene where we just want to sit in the room. We're just going to come today and just watch you sitting in the room. I'm like, what am I going to do in the room sitting all day long, you know? How much can you film? So they were watching me, and I'm sitting here like. Paint by number. Painting by number. And I'm like, so David, like, we're not here. Don't talk to us. Like, but you are here, and this camera up in my face. So I was just, you know. Well, fun. Sharon's very chatty. Mm -hmm. So we wanted some quieter, reflective moments of her. <laughs> How can you not be chatty with a camera in your face? So you figure you got to constantly be doing something. But they assured me, we just want you doing, just sitting painting. 
And so no, it's difficult if you're being filmed to to sort of just be reflective. 10, 15, and 10, 15 minutes is enough. Not a half an hour. You're just sitting there and every time you look up. <laughs> but no, they did a great job. I still say I'm so glad I did not fight them. And, and every day you came, I had a smile. I was glad to see you guys. Well, a little before we came, when she knew we were on our way, we would get them again. <laughs> She'd roll her eyes a little bit. But she was, the minute we got there, she was just so wonderful to us and embraced us, and we just felt totally at home. Yeah. Sharon, I'm curious, what does performing mean to you? Because part of the movie, we, we see you not being able to perform, you're, you're in recovery. But when you do perform both, you know, footage that we see prior to the diagnosis and, you know, footage at the beacon after, it is so clearly, at least to me as a viewer, that it is a lifeline for you, that it is something, I mean, there are a lot of people who perform, but there are some people who perform, and I think you are one of them, where it feels like, this is what you were put on this earth yeah. to do, and this is where you feel the, the happiest and that's, the best. That's my comfort. That's me. I mean, music is my life. You it's know. a transcendent thing watching you yeah. perform. It's just beautiful. And, I, and it's like, I, no matter what I'm going through, uh, you know, I mean, like, I've had to perform the nights that my mom's died. I had to still put on a show. My brother passed. I still had a show to go to, and I had to walk out there and leave those sadness and behind me but it's like and I and I'll say that I walk on that stage once that mic and I that audience I look in that audience face whatever pain I have whatever sadness whatever's going on doesn't matter to me anymore I'm on this stage now and this is my job and that's why I always said God have blessed me with a gift what I have is a gift it's nothing that I taught myself or took lessons it's just all natural and that's why I try to be so straight, natural. That's why I want everyone to see me in my environment, you know, how I am. This is, I'm going through this. This is not a superstar. You know, you see me in the makeup and you see me without it. You know, I have a life. I'm a human being and I'm natural, real. I try to stay real, be truthful, straight She's up. very real. I think that's what my fans grab on to really, I, I'll give me say, make up a word right now. <laughs> But just seeing the realness in me, so yeah. Do you feel like you learned anything new about yourself in the period of time that you were sick and couldn't perform, that you didn't have that outlet? Yeah, I did learn that I am a strong person and, I, and my faith, how much I believe in my faith. And, and that, that taught me, I, I am a pretty strong person because y'all see me there, but I get weak. I mean, I, I have my down times. But to see that, to see how much strength I do have, and I'm a fighter, and, and, I, and I thank God for giving me that strength to be able to, to look over things, not just be selfish, think about myself. But I, I learned a lot, you know, and I'm still going through a lot. So uh, my strength is still being tested every day. My faith is being tested, and, and it just makes me even more stronger. Uh, Barbara, go ahead, guys, clap, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Barbara, were you, you going to say something? Excuse me. Well, I was just going to say that um, Sharon also taught us a lot. She taught us about really being positive and really being passionate about the things that you do. And when you were talking to her about the beacon, I remember that like yesterday. We were backstage with Sharon, and she was sitting there, and she was sort of confessing and saying, you know, Barbara, what happens if I'm not the Sharon I always was? Because she hadn't really sang except in church once for seven months. What if I have to just sit there and I can't dance and I can't perform? Who is this new Sharon? And then we filmed her backstage and she was holding a cup and she was shaking with the cup. And then suddenly Binky said, Okay, you're now going to see Miss Sharon Jones, who kicked cancer in the ass. And you see this beautiful woman going up to the curtain, looking like a prize fighter, getting ready to walk in. And she goes in, and she kills it. And she's wonderful. 
Plus, she brings the audience in. She says, I haven't done this in a long time, and I'm testing it out on you. So she made them feel part of it, and they made her feel part of it. And it was just a beautiful thing that happened on that stage that night. Barbara, you've had, a, I think, a history going back to Harlan County of making documentaries about fighters, yeah. about people who are in the middle of a, of, a, of a big fight. And I'm wondering if you think that has something to do with your personal interests in storytelling or if that's just conflict in general in story and looking for a good story. No, I mean, everybody has a story. And whether it's Gregory Peck, um, or Wild Man Blues, Woody Allen, or the coal miners of Eastern Kentucky who are fighting for the rights to have a union. I mean, I was in my early 20s then, and we were machine gunned with semi-automatic carbines um, that just lit up the mountainside, and the head gun thug said, if I ever catch you alone, I'll kill you. You know, and at 20, you think you're going to live forever. Um, For anybody in the audience who hasn't seen Barbara's first film, Harlan County, USA, I highly recommend you go out and do it. It's a, a pillar of documentary film. Well, making. it's showing at the New York Film Festival this year. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you can see it. <laughs> um, in regard, well, actually, just a sort of side tangent. In regards to that, to that film, Harlan County, USA, we're in the midst of an election where coal miners are consistently being referenced and, and talked about. I'm curious how you feel about that when you see someone like Donald Trump, politics of side, stand on a stage and say, we're going to get the coal mines up and running again. I don't know. There's maybe about 20,000 coal miners in all of the United States. When I started doing that film, there were over 300,000. So I think we've come a long way, you know, and hopefully we're going to go towards solar and get rid of gas and oil that really hurts people and has explosions and... I hope that we're going to do something that's good for the environment, that really saves the environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Sharon, did you have any uh, awareness of Barbara Koppel before she, she showed up on your doorstep with a camera? No, I, I didn't have any. You know, All I knew was someone was going to direct me. I have no recollection of stuff to this day. Of, I'll be like, who? Huh? Where? <laughs> but, um, it's like, but once they told me what she was doing and then course, you know, saw the movies and got watched. I was like, wow, this got me with that coal mining thing. She was up in that coal, up in a <laughs> oh, like she, you up in the cave with the how did you, you know, that <laughs> totally amazing. So yeah, I mean, the things you went through with and to be threatened, you know, so yeah, she, I was like, this woman got balls. <laughs> you did too. <laughs> you both have. We're yeah. ballsy women. You both are extremely ballsy <laughs> women. And I think that's one of the great yeah. testaments of the film is that it's a it's by a woman and it's it's a and it's about a woman. Is that something yeah. that interested you as well? And was that and we that... care about each other. Yeah, we care what happens to yeah. each other. She's so. my friend now, guys. Yes. It's not like after this movie, I'll never see her again. No, I think this is going to be. She stuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the beautiful things about the film as well is your relationship with your band, which I oh. think a lot of people don't know about because a lot of times when it comes to sort of the name at the front of the band and then the band behind it, it's a rotating group of players that the sort of lead singer is just the sort of head of, whereas you have this incredible relationship yeah. with, with your band. Can you talk about that? Well, my band, not only the relationship of the most of them write the songs. I mean, we sit down and they come up with these lyrics. They're going to tell a story that they know that I'm going to enjoy doing because I'm not going to sing or talk about anything that I can't relate to. I mean, I've had them to come in with some songs, some lyrics, and I'm like, you know, I don't talk like that. You know, when have you ever heard me talk like that? You know, I'll change the lyrics around, you know, or it's just like or they'll have something like, Talking some stupid, like, look, one thing about me, I'm not no weak woman, so no, don't write nothing about, yeah, you can go ahead and beat me and I'm going to still love you. No. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> do not write, I'm not going to sing. A, like, even leading some songs, like Aretha, like, tell me, do the chain, chain, chain. I'm, like, I'm not nobody's fool. I'm not going to be nobody length in the chain, so I don't want to sing that song. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but it's just, I sometimes I may go into stuff, too, but that's the love for the band, and they know me and just, be around and so many years. My drummer was 16. He wrote a song. I'm gonna tell you about this real fast. 
um, the song that when you buy the album, Get Up and Get Out, it's like, you know, that's how I sing a song. But by the time now, that song means, I say cancer, you get up and you get out. And I shout in that because that dancing, that's showing my energy, that's showing me, you know, what I can do. So I changed that song around. And at first, I couldn't learn the song because I'm like, what is this stupid song about? <laughs> I know it. <laughs> and he was like, well, you think of just the drama. If I tell her she may not want to sing the song, right. you're going to tell me what this song about because <laughs> I'm not going to sing it anyway because I, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's about bed bugs. Yep. <laughs> The whole song is about bed bugs, you know. I've been laying with you night after night. You leave before I see the morning light. You know, I always say you're not welcome no more. But that's what got me when you knock. I open up the door and say, get up and get out. I, can, I couldn't understand why you're going to knock on the door and I'm going to say, get up and get out. And so once he told me it was about bed bugs, then I was able to take the song and make it mine and change it around to mean something. Sharon, I'm curious, you know, uh, I think as the as the the film says at the beginning, and as we were talking about a little bit in this interview of how you know you were a, a guard at Rikers in the in the eighties, and you sort of been plugging away with your band for a long time. You have this studio in Bushwick that you we see in the trailer that you oh. built by hand, and then in the film we see you getting this mainstream recognition, you know that you've never necessarily had before. You're getting on Ellen, you're on Fallon, but it's also in the midst of your battle with cancer, yeah. what did that feel like? If you can even answer that question, I mean, that's a hard thing I bet to articulate, yeah. but what did that feel like to suddenly feel like you had made it while at the same time your body was working yeah. against you? Yeah, and, and that, that was the shocker to me. Like, when they told me in the hospital, like, the first thought, once the doctor came in and sit down, and, you know, you've been at the hospital, they would come in with 8, 10, 12 doctors, they all stand up looking at you. And this one day he came in by himself, I was like, uh-oh. What is this? And that's when he sit and told me the cancer where it was pancreatic. He knew he got it all, you know. But when he first said, well, you know, you had this, and I was like, I'm going to die. And I just knew because I had been reading up. I hate reading up on stuff. Right now I don't follow it. I don't read up on it because you'll go too much into it. Go down the rabbit hole. I, and I just knew pancreatic, I'm going to die right away, you know. So I'm grateful for these few years that I still have and still battling. It's a very aggressive cancer, which I know, but I'm going to keep battling, and I can't dwell on that. So my first thought, for about two hours, my album was going to be out, people's going to buy it, and I was going to be here for it. I did thought that. But, um, and making this film, I never thought that we were going to lose her for a moment, mm -hmm. not a moment. She cheered up when she was having chemo. She was like sunshine coming into that room and everybody talked to her and she was telling jokes and talking to people. And I've never seen anybody so strong and so positive and so passionate. And she did so much for those people. I couldn't agree more. I mean, in, 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 there were moments of watching it, a lot of moments actually where I forgot that Sharon was sick because you are so filled with life. And compared to, I mean, there's been lots of documentaries and, and movies about people with cancer. But rarely have I ever seen someone so filled with life while going through treatment for, as you said, a very aggressive cancer. How did you sustain that? My faith, my belief, and having people around me that love you, that's there. No one around me feeling sorry. That's one thing. You know, if any of you have friends, someone you know going through cancer, just got, don't show pity. Don't show sadness. Just be supportive. Be happy. And, and that's what I had around me. And the band was like, whatever you decide, whatever you do, Sharon, we here. You know, and so that's why that dinner scene hurt me so bad because I'm not around my family and the Dap Kings were my family. And I went through all of this and we're going to eat a Thanksgiving dinner. I'm going to be with family. And then <laughs> they come up and say, well, we changed our mind. And I lost my mind for a couple of seconds, but you saw how we made up and everything was okay. So... That is. I, had, I love that moment. I was watching that moment going, good. She, does, she deserves some catharsis. Let her yell at these people. She can yell at whoever she wants. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, also, at the last scene in the film, oh, yeah, um, Sharon sings this song, I've Got Something to Shout About. Yes, right? Get Up and Get Out. Get That's up, the one I changed up. around. Yep. 
that's the way I do it from now on, always live. I think about Tina Turner. But Tina Turner been there. the band didn't know what she was going to do. Yeah. And she started rapping. You know, I've got my doctor to thank and my lawyer to thank and you, the fans, to thank. And, mm -hmm. you know, she went on and on with that. And they were right with her. And the audience was right with her. I mean, they always have her back. They always read her. If she's getting out of breath, they'll play a little slower. If they think she can boogie, they'll play a little faster. Well, there's the uh, Sharon Jones performance, and I've seen Sharon Jones live before. The audience is never not with Sharon Jones while she's on stage. It's one of the great, you're one of the great performers, and everybody is along for the ride the whole time. I, I try to do that. I like hypnotize you all. That's what I do. <laughs> you do? You, yeah. do, you absolutely but no, do. No, I really just, I just, you know, people don't realize you look at them and it, you're making them part of you. Like when I look in your eye, I'm like, hey, baby, I'm with this saying. You're, you're like, me? <laughs> you know, and, and, I, and I look and I, and I love that. And, and that's, how, that's how we have all that energy on stage. I'm feeding off the band, they're feeding off me, and I'm feeding off the audience. So we all just like, just reaching for something, so. And she hypnotized us, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to open, open it up to the audience for questions. Does anybody have any questions out here? Hi, Ms. Sharon and Ms. Barbara. Um, okay, so I, first of all, I wanted to say congratulations on your voice and, you know, sharing your testimony. It's so inspiring, and I pray that God continues to use you to fulfill your purpose and your mission um, and to strengthen you as well. I have two questions. With life so, like, um, conscious to you now, going through everything that you've been through, what is something that you would tell people who may take life for granted? And what is something that you haven't done that you would like to do? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I think don't take life, you just live your life to the fullest. Try to, I mean, smile more, be happy. Just, I mean, just being nice. I mean, what is wrong with people being nice to each other? Why can't you smile? You know, why that person got to be, you hate that person because they look different to you all day. You know, and I just feel given more love. And I think people out here, just stop thinking about yourself, what you're going through with, and just give more love to reach out and be more happy. You know, that's where I feel. You know, each day, take it one day at a time, but look at life to its fullest. We never know. Yeah, I may have cancer right now, and I, some people are like, oh, She's not gonna be here long. You don't know how long I'm gonna be here. I don't know how long I'm, you don't know how long you're gonna be here sitting here right now. So just live your life to the fullest and being nice to each other. And the last thing you said was, oh my God, so many things. I've, I've always wanted to, I'm gonna change that cause somebody may try to make me do it now. I'm getting older now, I'm 60, I changed. But I've always wanted to parachute, jump out of my <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. It's a real sense of freedom. But, but right now at 60, I don't know my heart. I don't know. But yeah, that was one thing I really wanted. To, I always wanted to figure that one to do. Probably some more stuff in a second, but that was, I just threw that out there. Sharon never wants to miss a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming on. You've been really inspirational. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know, how many days filming did it take for you to make this, this documentary? Ooh. I'd say two and a half or three years. Yeah. Not every right. single day, but over that period. Yeah. Um, our last shoot was in um, 2015, and our first shoot was August 30th, mm. 2013. How did you go about choosing your days as a documentary filmmaker who's been working for, uh, who's made a number of films? I'm sure you have a sort of method when it comes to choosing what you're going to film and, and why you're going to film that day. You know, you don't have a method. Each film is so different. And you just know that you don't want to miss anything. You don't want to leave a stone unturned. So we're there as much as we possibly can be. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, you seem like you listen to a lot of music, and I was wondering if you own any vinyl, what records do you like to listen to? Believe it or not, I, I just got this little vinyl. I wasn't the one that into vinyl collecting, because you realize I came up in the 60s and stuff when all this stuff was out, so I, I'm not a collector. And um, so I don't, you know, 
most vinyls I listen to have been my vinyl recently, you know, because they've had them on somewhere planning. But yeah, I just, my music is just really, when I'm home in my car, I have series and I keep it on Soul Town. I, I listen to, it's like I'm stuck in a warp of, of old music. I just figure the more you hear it, the more you stay relaxed, just keeping, you know. Sharon, who would you say your greatest influence is as a as musician? Well, I have a lot. I mean, really, I, I can say I have to be truthful. I mean, everyone will expect me to say James Brown true because he was born in Augusta, but my influence that inspired me was Aretha Franklin. And, um, yeah, and and to and and that was when I saw her. Excuse me, <clears throat> on that that album, the Amazing Grace, which she had the daishiki on, and you know, and so to be that much to this woman meant so much to me. And when I first met her, it was such a disappointment. And that's something I in my life, not talking bad about Rita, still love my Rita. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I just feel that me as an entertainer, as you as a young person come up and you admire me and you singing my stuff, I'm gonna smile at you and say, baby, you did a good job. I'm not gonna like be hating you for doing me or making myself, yeah, she doing me. I'm the greatest thing in the world. And I think that was my disappointment when I met her that she never said a word to me. It just like took a picture. And, and so, but Aretha was my biggest influence. So there you go. And my dream for Sharon, oh, yes. is for her to sell a million records. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm putting it out there, y'all. I'm putting it out there. So I think today people can see Miss Sharon Jones in theaters, right? Yes, it, it opens tonight, which is July 29th. And if you want to really be good to me, tomorrow's my birthday. Oh, oh happy birthday, and Barbara. Thank you. And so if you wanted to come, uh, that would be the greatest birthday oh. present for me. Go see Miss Sharon Jones right? and buy some Sharon Jones and the Dab Kings vinyl. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.